Um, thank you all and uh, welcome to the NNI Nano EHS webinar, What We Know About Nano EHS Human Health. My name is Janet Carter. I'm a senior health scientist with the Department of Labor, Occupational Safety and Health Administration. And it is my privilege um, and pleasure to moderate today's webinar. Now, this is the fourth webinar in a series that covers the range of topics the NNI has been investigating for the past 20 years and uh, was highlighted in the 2011 NNI research strategies, which is still very relevant today. We have a great lineup of speakers today with a wide ranging background to cover the vast area of human health science. Uh, but before I introduce our distinguished speakers today, I just wanna give you a little background to cover some basic information um, and give you some perspective on this topic. So if we can get to the presentation, that would be great. Thank you. I'm gonna uh, take myself off video. So, um, so again, this is the um, what we know about uh, human health webinar for the NNI. And um, <clears throat> I just kind of want to start with the, even after more than two decades of research uh, into the potential health effects from exposure to nanomaterials, we still hear a lot of comments from people that we really don't know anything about the human health uh, effects of um, exposure to nanomaterials, or there really are no good studies to do a risk assessment. So let's just take a moment to see where it all began and uh, where we're going. The next slide, please. <clears throat> So even though nanomaterials have been around for quite some time, it wasn't until the 90s that concern grew about the exposure to nanomaterials. From studies indicating nanosized particles were more inflammatory than micron-sized particles, to epidemiological studies indicating that ultrafine particles uh, were responsible for causing uh, a wide range of issues, including cardiovascular um, issues. And then there were pharmaceutical studies showing nanoparticles could cross the blood-brain barrier. Um, Nano-sized nano particles could translocate from portal of entry to other organ systems. This all got a lot of press. So there was a lot of concern. Um, and just the next slide, please. Um, this, this slide demonstrates um, kind of what I was talking about, about the inflammatory effects. It's an analysis of data by Dr. Gunter Oberdorster in 1994, where he looked at ultrafine particles and showed that they were more inflammatory than micron-sized particles of the same chemistry. And I've also included additional references if uh, people are, are interested in looking at that. Now, the next slide. <clears throat> um, As more research was done, more questions arose, such as what was the proper um, dose metric? Are we properly characterizing these materials? What form is being biologically presented? Are they agglomerates or are they aggregates? Is there a biological coating that's formed on these, like protein coronas? Do we have sufficient information or measurement techniques and instrumentation to really look to evaluate these materials? And are current test methods adequate to uh, look at nanomaterials and biological matrices, or do we have to develop others? The next slide, please. Um, so this slide shows, uh, so this really shows, this slide shows the um, kind of the crux of that, um, the dose metric problem. Uh, you have particles of, of, if you have the same amount of particle and you're exposing um, as the particle size decreases, the number of particles and the surface area increases. Now, <clears throat> uh, so this suggests that cells when exposed to nanosized particles come in contact with far greater number of particles than if they were exposed to larger size particles of the same chemistry. And this has been suggested to be a factor in the increases observed in inflammatory mechanisms. Uh, next slide, please. So to be clear, there has been a significant amount of research beyond the legacy materials of titanium dioxide uh, or carbon black. And we're right now the research is moving well beyond the simple materials to more complex materials and the advanced materials versus the legacy materials that I just uh, talked about. Plus we're looking at mixtures and life cycle assessments. 
And to answer the question of, you know, we don't have enough information to do research, well, or to do risk assessment, certainly we do have uh, a lot of information and, and uh, agencies like NIOSH, EPA, FDA, and others have published risk assessments on uh, numerous nanomaterials. Now that's not to say that we don't need more and that's not to say that uh, we don't need to do a better job. We always do, and we do with all materials. So it's really important that we we move forward in this in this area, but I want to be clear that we actually do have a lot of information. And so the next slide, please. And this really brings me to our speakers today. We have four great speakers: uh, Dr. Christy Says, uh, Dr. Um, <clears throat> Leanne Gilbertson, Dr. Gavin West, and Dr. Bruce Lippy. And they will be describing their researches in um, in a little more detail here. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the first up is Dr. Christy Says, who is an Associate Professor of Environmental Studies at Baylor University. Christy has more than a decade of research experience in the field of nanotechnology and uh, nanotoxicology, investigating the fate transformation and biological effects of individual particles and particle systems. Uh, Christy will be, will be providing an overview of her research in this field, and with that, I'll give it to Christy. Thank you very much, Janet. I'd like to thank the organizers of this symposium, um, as well as uh, the NNI for hosting this webinar. And of course, uh, to all of you attendees who are here today, I am humbled for the number of people that are in attendance and the, the sheer number of, um, of what I call big names in this space, in this nanotoxicology space. Um, looking at the people in attendance, I am not the one that should be here speaking to you today because all of you are people who I have learned from over the years. And I've tried very humbly to contribute to this, this field of, of study by putting out one paper at a time on different things that interest me and try to address some concerns that nanotox research um, has revealed to us over the years. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll begin. Um, and I just want to uh, let everybody know that we're charged with uh, eight minute talks um, in this webinar. So um, we can only be very brief of the highlights that we want to say. Early on, there are two major lessons that were learned in nanotoxicology. And I think those lessons were meaningful for both the chemists and the toxicologists. At the beginning, it was, in my point of view, it was chemists working with toxicologists, toxicologists working with chemists. Now, of course, it's a lot more interdisciplinary. Uh, than that, but when I was trained in this space, it really was the chemist and toxicologist interaction. You know, and these two meaningful lessons I, I really, really were um, appreciated by both camps. First, that nanomaterials have structure. And this means um, now it maybe it's not so so novel, but you know, there's what we call the PCC, physical chemical characterization. You know, chemicals, of course, they have some, some, they have a, a lot of chemical properties and chemical attributes, but only small amount of physical. When we started moving into nanotoxicology, the physical properties became just as important as the chemical properties themselves. And it's those physical properties that really had the switch go off in my head and other people's heads that a nanomaterial is not a chemical, it's not a molecule, but it, but it is a, a material, a particle itself. And it has structural properties that, are in, that influence what the biological response might be. The second is that the nanomaterial properties influence both the in vitro responses as well as the in vivo responses uh, alike. Um, one thing that I've learned um, through my postdoc advisor, Dr. David Warheit, is that these effects that we may observe in the in vitro system, yeah, we may still see them in an in vivo uh, system, but they're le to a lesser degree. Um, we observe those effects to a lesser degree than that in the in vitro system. Here, I'm just showing two different papers that were published, um, uh, to, I believe, two years um, from each other. They were both looking at this um, poster child of engineered nanomaterial called the C60 molecule. 
Um, this is a nice engineered nanomaterial because it does have molecular properties as well as um, classical mechanical properties whenever it forms a crystal itself. Um, we can functionalize the surface of the C60 molecule and what we discovered, what we all discovered as a community, was that as you change the surface of the engineered nanomaterial, you, you change the properties um, in the, do the LC50 value, the dose response, um, and to the right here, uh, pathology and histology such as tissue thickening or accumulation of liquid um, in, in the lungs, in the alveolar space in particular. Moving on to the next slide, um, eventually scientists over the next um, five years or so became increasingly more exponentially more molecular in what these toxicological responses might be. And this push, I mean, we saw this push and there were hundreds and thousands of papers that would start to be published on molecular um, analysis, uh, molecular biology after nanoparticle exposure. This is where we kind of started to look at low dose exposures. We started to look at time course exposures and there were a plethora of papers published that started putting out, okay, what are some genes that are perturbed? What are some pathways that are triggered? We saw the emergence of uh, pathway analysis um, for up and down regulated genes and proteins, cytokines, enzymes, and the like, as well as some knocked down cells and CRISPR started to kind of, um, uh, emerge in this in this time where people would knock down one particular pathway in a cell type um, or even in a genetically modified um, mouse model uh, to be able to see if that particular pathway was really the, 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 the mode of action or mechanism of action for that nanomaterial induced toxicity that we're uh, observing. Next slide. Um, from this point, it was my observation that um, those hundreds and thousands of papers that I mentioned previously <laughs> were um, focused on oxidative stress as the predominant health effect. And something that, that I come to re came to realize over the years was that oxidative stress was nonspecific. Oxidative stress was the reason for a lot of toxicological outcomes that we would report in, in the more modern AOPs, adverse outcome pathways, um, in, stress, in any sort of stress-related animal or cell type or even nowadays organoids. And, you know, oxidative stress is, is probably still the most reported upon endpoint um, out there in the nanotox literature we start to see some evolution past oxidative stress to something a little bit more specific. So yes, oxidative stress, but is it inducing an immune response, an inflammatory response? Is it inducing some cell cycle arrest? Is it inducing apoptosis? And more recently, is the oxidative stress inducing mitophagy? Um, we know now um, this is something that may not be um, it's, it's obvious now, but years ago, the idea that the nanoparticle could generate reactive, reactive oxygen species based off of the surface chemistry, but the mitochondria could also produce the reactive oxygen species because of the stress inducing, the focus on mitochondrial stress, mitochondrial degradation, and mitophagy has emerged as one particular way that we can look at la longer lasting effects of a nanoparticle exposure uh, uh, or if because mitophagy is initiated, our resilience, um, the animal model and, and human and environmental response resilience to be able to overcome that oxidative stress. Next slide. So um, just to change gears slightly to hit on the, the, the point that Janet already mentioned, which is dose metrics, dosimetry. I have to admit in my early days of working in this, I did not understand dosimetry. I didn't respect it in the sense that I didn't even, wasn't aware that it really meant something. You know, and it was really people like Gunther Orbedoister and Justin Teagarden that really were pushing this um, 10 years ago or so, um, you know, even early, early um, in the, earlier in the 90s, but, you know, it, it also in the mid 2000s as well, that, dos, that dosimetry matters for both an in vivo system as well as an in vitro system. And this is where our jargony terms in our publications started to get more precise. We'll be talking about an administered dose, we'll be talking about deposited dose, internalized dose. All these different words were not commonplace at the very beginning in the 
late 90s and early 2000s, but they eventually started perpetrating our literature very well so that we could start making heads or tails on dose. Next slide. So I'm ending this uh, short talk by just think, telling you about things that I'm personally thinking about these days. Right now, I'm really um, fascinated um, by the lack of methods out there for us to be able to look at the effects after uh, exposure to two different nanomaterials simultaneously. Um, so for instance, um, you can use in, in vitro models are, in my opinion, one of the easier way to go about this. The uh, in case you're not familiar with the term isobolo, uh, isobolograms or isobolographic analysis. These are ways to be able to, once you have full complete uh, dose response curves and identify LC50 values for individual materials, you can then plot them on an isobologram to be able to determine if mixtures of those two, such as 80-20 or 50-50, shown on this particular slide here to the right, whether or not those are inducing synergistic effects, antagonistic effects, or additive effects. Uh, this is something that I'm working on right now and starting to publish in this space. Next slide. Lastly, I'm very um, interested. Next slide. There we go. Um, and of course, refining in vitro models even more so. Uh, I started out learning pulmonary toxicology. I'm still interested in pulmonary toxicology, specifically co-culturing different cell types, um, specifically in the alveolar space in a three-dimensional model, and then looking for immunological effects after low dose and repeated exposures. Um, one thing that we've learned in the literature is that cells that reside in the apical chamber, like macrophages or epithelial cells, they can change before and after exposure. Uh, pan on the right side, panel A versus C are looking at unexposed cells at the top, exposed cells at the bottom of cells ex exposed to uh, some um, engineered nanomaterials. And then on the B and D are the basolateral um, chamber where you have the dendritic cells unactivated for the untreated cells versus activated in the treated cells. So with that, I will end. I hope I wasn't too far over time, um, but I left the last slide for just a couple, next slide, a uh, couple of take home messages from this talk. Um, we see, we can observe adverse health effects in, after nanoparticle exposed or nanomaterial exposed models. Um, in vivo responses are less pronounced than in vitro. Nanotoxicology can be related to specific modes of action and mechanisms of action. Oxidative stress um, is, uh, is, is due to reactive oxygen species and, if, and they can overwhelm the system and induce things like mitophagy. Nanomaterial property, even with all the nano, the nanomaterial properties identified, dose is still one of the most, if not the most important influence on nanop nanomaterial induced toxicological responses. And exposure to nanoparticles or nanoparticle and chemical mixtures um, can occur and does occur. And that's where I'm looking out into the future. With that, I'll end. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chrissy. That was great. Um, our next speaker uh, will be uh, Dr. Leanne Gilbertson. Uh, Leanne is an assistant professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at University of Pittsburgh. Leanne's research focuses on developing information to inform sustainable design of existing and novel materials to reduce the potential harm to environmental and human health using an experimental approach and a life cycle modeling. So thank you, uh, Le Leanne. Well, thank you, Janet. Um, and I'd like to echo Christy's sentiments, thanking the organizers uh, for the invitation to be here, you, the audience, for spending the time to be here, and I'm really looking forward to the discussion. Um, as Christy mentioned, we, we were tasked with fitting a lot into to eight minutes, and she did a wonderful job. Um, I'm hoping to, to follow in her lead here. Uh, you know, the, the slide on my background, um, which is the next slide, is simply just to uh, indicate to you all then, oh, yep, there we go, um, where my perspective is coming from. And that is one that has, uh, was kind of grounded in, in chemistry. And then I shifted into the environmental engineering space. And so my research interests are really focused on underlying chemical principles of nanomaterials and their interaction with biological and natural systems. And I think you'll see that um, in the next slide. I'll introduce sort of my perspective on three areas related to nano EHS. 
Um, and so, you know, Christy um, and Bruce and, and Dr. W Dr. West and Dr. Lippy and, and Dr. Sayer, they should uh, refer to you as that, um, have, have very different or uh, perspectives and experiences than I do. And, and I think what you'll find is that there's intersections between our work, um, but also that we represent very different uh, or the many perspectives um, and many approaches to, to this particular topic of nano EHS. Mine's gonna really focus around um, design of the material. Uh, and I'm going to highlight three general areas of, of my research that are related to design for inherency, understanding mechanisms to help direct the design of those materials and developing of, of design guidelines, um, and then uh, thinking about the materials within the larger system of the, the product or ultimate use that they're, that they're in. Um, next slide. Uh, so, sort of my, my graduate training really instilled in me the value and the principles of, of green chemistry and green engineering. And this body of work um, was really around trying to reduce risk by designing the material to make sure that their inherent hazard was reduced or eliminated as much as possible. By reducing or eliminating this inherent hazard of the material, it means that you all, that you um, reduce the risk without having to really manage the exposure aspect of, of the risk equation. And so the approach um, that I take in, in my group to this is, is trying to manipulate the chemistry of, of materials. And I'm showing here carbon-based nanomaterials. That's going to be my uh, my material of choice for this afternoon's presentation. Um, and as Christy mentioned, it's really nice. It has some molecular properties and you can uh, decorate the surface really nicely with different chemistries. And those chemistries will influence the physical chemical properties of the material. We know that those properties will, in will influence the way that the materials interact with biological and environmental systems. And so what we do is, is we kind of control the chemistry we introduce these materials to uh, model systems, and then we try to connect that material or the biological outcome back to the material chemistry. What that does is it helps us develop these design rules that will enable us to control the inherent hazard of these materials. Now, to develop these rules, you need to simplify the biological system. And so I'm showing a range of model systems that we have used. Anything from an antioxidant molecule, that's glutathione, something that um, Christy showed some data on, on glutathione in, in one of her slides. Uh, bacteria, algae, and aquatic organisms. And you might be thinking this is a um, webinar on human health systems, but we don't do our tests or our environmental health and safety. We don't do our tests and, and test these materials in human systems. What we try to do is simplify and use these model um, systems and then extrapolate our results up the, the um, trophic levels. Um, these materials are complex. Uh, they can be dynamic depending on the, the system or the environment that they're in. And the biological organism or the molecule is super complex. And the media adds a level of complexity on top of that. And so um, in order to kind of uh, reduce the interactions to identify sort of these um, truths about how the material chemistry is governing the behavior, um, we try to do our best to manipulate a single variable at one time. And so there's a lot of experimentation and, and manipulation um, that occurs very carefully to then develop these structure property hazard relationships. And then we validate that by testing new materials um, in, in the same biological systems. And then what we do is we try to, try to um, extrapolate and test these across trophic levels to try to get to more governing guidelines for design to see whether the underlying um, design rules that we develop for a simple antioxidant molecule will transfer as we increase the complexity of the organism. The main takeaways from this body of, of research is really that the surface chemistry does really matter. Um, and the uh, specific functional group and those, the properties, particularly the electron withdrawing and donating properties of that group, independent of other inherent or consequential properties can guide the, the biological outcome that we measure. Um, oxidative stress and physical interactions have become important. And then as we increase the complexity of the organism, particularly as we move up to aquatic organisms, some of our most recent work has, taught, has um, showed that the mechanism through which the material interacts and causes an adverse outcome 
um, differs. And so thinking about, um, for me at least, how these design guidelines can translate uh, is important. Uh, next slide. Um, so in addition to what, you know, so the body of work that I just talked about, really digging down and refining at the mechanistic level what's going on is really important um, to understanding how and why things are happening. Um, and this is an extra level of refinement for guiding the design of these materials. Um, I'm showing a, a specific, or, or we've looked into a specific mechanism of glutathione and graphene oxide uh, reactions. And in this work, we've coupled experimental and computational methodologies. Uh, this builds on a body of work from Bob Hertz group at Brown University, and they've done an immense amount of, of really great work in this area, um, Bob working with Agnes Kane, and I highlight two of their relevant uh, publications here to this specific mechanism. Um, but definitely has um, been a key influencer on, on our work in this space. Um, and, I, and I think that there's an immense amount of value and power in coupling experimental and computational methodologies, but it's also very challenging to do this. Um, and, and specifically in you know, the simplification that's necessary in order to have a manageable computational power and the relevance um, to sort of the environment and human systems. Um, but the, the level of information that we can extract from this is really um, eye-opening. Uh, so in this particular study, uh, we were able to identify the epoxide groups, probably unsurprisingly, but um, with sort of thermodynamics to back it up, the epoxide groups neighboring with a hydroxyl group was the lowest energy reaction mechanism for glutathione oxidizing to the glutathione disulfide. And so what this does is it's connecting specific chemical features in the material to um, a specific biological outcome. And here it's the oxidation of glutathione, um, which is a cellular antioxidant. So it's a defense mechanism for, for cells. Um, and so that's why it's a good model uh, molecular reaction to, to um, study. And so what this is telling us is that now we know how to specifically manipulate uh, or how we can manipulate the chemistry to either drive this reaction or inhibit the reaction or minimize the reaction from occurring. Uh, next slide. So to the third point that, that I wanna uh, bring into the discussion is this idea of, of a lot of work being done about the material itself and specifically the material interactions um, with different cell lines or model systems. Uh, but I think what we've grown to appreciate more recently is the fact that these materials are and, and um, their interactions uh, are just one stage in the entire life cycle. Um, and so I'm sticking here with carbon nanomaterials as, as sort of my theme, but the ideas can translate to other nanomaterials similarly. Um, there's a lot of impacts particularly upstream in the raw material use uh, and the synthesis. So what I'm uh, showing on the left side here is the embodied energy of carbon nanomaterial synthesis. This was out of Jackie Isaac's group at Northeastern and uh, was one of the first papers to really highlight the three different sort of major synthesis approaches and the energy demand compared to known energy intensive materials. And then on the right are uh, different volatile organic carbon emissions from CNT or carbon nanotube synthesis. And this was um, Desiree Plata's work as a PhD student. She's um, now at MIT and essentially identifying uh, a variety of different uh, uh, chemicals that were emitted in the synthesis process that would be something that we need to be aware of um, and potentially um, uh, limit the exposure of those that were actually synthesizing the materials. Um, and then finally, you know, the, the main reason I included this cover art here is because I think it nicely demonstrates the complexity that we're now realizing um, needs to be incorporated into thinking about the sustainability of nanomaterials. And that's the fact that these materials are being incorporated into, um, you know, products here as a general polymer matrix. Uh, they're released over their use. Um, and then we also have these products at end of life uh, that, e that may still have nanomaterials in them and whether how we treat them at end of life for recycle, reuse or disposal, um, there's also going to be environmental and human exposure pathways that we need to consider. 
No material or device is going to be without impacts. And so a big uh, thrust of my work now is sort of quantifying, developing methods and quantifying these trade-offs of, you know, what does the technology offer? What's the functional or sustainable benefit that the technology provides? And then how are the trade-offs with the environmental health and safety costs? And of course, we want to have those shifted in, in favor of the benefits. And then my final slide um, is sort of forward-looking and, and some of the things that we're working on now. And that is, you know, to think about um, you know, nanomaterials were, are no longer a class of, of unknown uh, behavior. We don't, a class of materials that we don't know what their behavior is um, and that we're trying to get ahead of them being widely used. Um, they're currently being produced and being used in applications at increasing rates. And so as we think about what are the next stages for environmental health and safety with nanomaterials, um, I think we need to be uh, accepting the fact that they're are real potentials for nanomaterials to tackle these larger global challenges, whether it's providing safe and clean drinking water or combating antimicrobial resistance or providing food in a sustainable manner for our growing population. Um, in all of these examples, which are areas that my group is now working in, uh, the human exposure is inherent to uh, the nanomaterial use in these applications. And so we need to be thinking about how do we design this into our materials and our co concept of the system of use of nanomaterials because this human exposure and environmental exposure is inevitable. Um, some applications, just my final point here, some applications of nanomaterials, there's an intended toxic endpoint, whether it's trying to, um, kill a particular fungi or pest in um, growth of, of crops, whether it's trying to inactivate or prevent the proliferation of anti uh, uh, bacteria that are resistant to um, drugs and other antibacterials. And so how do we, you know, the, the extra level of refinement now around design is how do we enable those functionalities where there is a toxic endpoint without having the adverse pathways for um, human toxicological endpoints. And so I think this is a really complex problem to think about. Um, and some of the, the research I have here are, are papers that are beginning to, to present ways that we can approach these, these challenges. So with that, I, um, I know I went longer. Sorry about that. I'll finish up and, and look forward to our discussion. Thank you, Leanne. That was an excellent presentation. Uh, we have two more excellent presentations. Uh, so our third and fourth speakers are from the Center for Construction Research and Training, Drs. Gavin West and Dr. Uh, Bruce Lippy. Now, first up is Gavin West, who is the Director of Nanomaterials Research at CPWR, with nearly a decade of research experience in this area. Uh, Gavin will be discussing applied learnings for nanotoxicity studies to occupational settings, specifically uh, the construction industry. Um, take it away, Gavin. Thank you so much, Janet. <clears throat> so I'd like to dive right into our next topic, which is progress in working safety with engineered nanomaterials in construction. So for those who are not familiar with us, CPWR has served as the NIOSH National Construction Center since 1990 through a series of cooperative agreements. We are a nonprofit organization focused on construction, health, and safety, and we are established by North America's Building Trades Unions. And if you'd like to know more about our research, training, and service activities, I'd encourage you to visit us online. Next slide, please. But before moving on, I'd like to briefly acknowledge that there have been many great people we've worked with who have contributed to our work over the years, and um, a good deal of them are shown on this slide. Next, please. CPWR research aligns with NNI goal number four, to support responsible development of nanotechnology. So as you can see on this graphic, our focus in terms of worker exposure, uh, it can occur at many different stages of the life cycle of a nano-enabled product. Next slide, please. Goal four objectives include quantifying exposures and assessing the physical chemical properties of nanomaterials throughout the product life cycle. And as you see here, there are different potentials for exposure throughout the life cycle. And our work is focused primarily on installation and maintenance of building construction materials. Next, please. 
CPWR maintains an inventory with over 700 construction materials that are reported to be nano-enabled. And this gives us a good baseline for understanding the benefits of these products, how they are used, and where and how exposures could occur. Next slide, please. CPWR has conducted multiple exposure studies involving paints, coatings, and cementitious materials, which we found to comprise the bulk of our inventory. So on this slide, we see some photos from our studies. We've examined tasks like spraying and sanding of paints, as well as cutting, drilling, and nailing of roofing tiles. Next slide, please. Our studies and others show that engineered nanomaterials tend to remain bound to the materials to which they are added. So we see some electron mic micrographs on this slide illustrating different types of nanoparticles contained within paint spray droplets as well as sanding dust particles. Next, please. Most exposures we quantified were unlikely to exceed existing occupational exposure limits. So I encourage you to read some of our, the studies we've published and uh, also the NIOSH current intelligence bulletins that established these recommended exposure limits. So one exception we found uh, where we, we deemed there was a risk of uh, possibly exceeding uh, the recommended exposure limit for titanium dioxide in the nanoscale was during spray application. Next slide. Our research also shows that exposure controls used in construction are effective. So on the slide, we see the hierarchy of controls ranging from most effective at the top to least effective at the bottom. And this local exhaust ventilation is a type of engineering control that uh, was attached to the power sander in our study. And we found it resulted in statistically significant reductions in airborne nanoparticle emissions, which is a good, which is good news from a worker health perspective. Next slide, please. And I like this slide very much. Some of you may recognize it if you attended a prior uh, webinar in this series. This was presented by Dr. Aaron Erdley of NIOSH. And I like this slide because it represents what I think the NNI does very well, which is uh, coordinating and fostering collaboration between multiple stakeholders and federal agencies. So we've sought to do the same with our work. Our funding, funding agency, NIOSH, is an NNI member. And you see our simulated worker studies, we've, we've uh, collaborated with, with partners to try to integrate what we are doing with the NIOSH field team, uh, as, as well as their laboratory studies, looking both at exposure as well as toxicity of materials. And so I showed on that prior slide what we found in terms of the physical chemical properties of materials uh, released from construction products. And I think that's important for informing occupationally relevant toxicity assessments. And here we see micrographs of carbon nanotubes protruding from cement particles. Next slide, please. We're also partnering with the Virginia Department of Transportation to study carbon nanotube exposures during a process called laser ablation coatings removal. So this would be during bridge work, during stripping of these coatings uh, as shown on the slide. Next. Another thing we plan to look at moving forward is to study the effects of weathering on exposure. So consider this road surface. There could be engineered nanomaterials in the asphalt as well as in the striping of the road surface. And over time, these materials will be exposed to the elements and different chemical processes as uh, weathering uh, occurs. And eventually they'll be subjected to mechanical force during demolition or maintenance. So we're interested to see how uh, extended along uh, weathering affects exposure. Uh, next slide, please. And I'll be handing it over to Bruce. Thank you. So, um... Last but not least, definitely not least, is uh, uh, Dr. Bruce Lippi. Uh, Bruce is Director of Safety Research at CPWR with more than two decades of research in industrial hygiene ranging from nanomaterials to asbestos to the effects of heat, climate change on working environments and IH best practices. And Bruce is going to discuss uh, some training and educational information um, that I think is very relevant uh, to, for audiences today. So thank you very much and, and take it away, Bruce. Thank you. And uh, I very much appreciate this opportunity. Uh, and I wanna thank the NNI. I've been a big fan for a long time. I've been in industrial hygiene since 1978. It's so good to see the federal government getting out ahead 
of issues like nanomaterials. <clears throat> so I want to start by, by actually reading the goal from the NNI, um, which is goal three from the strategic plan, and that is to develop and sustain educational resources, a skilled workforce, and the supporting infrastructure and tools to advance nanotechnology. And that's a picture of me doing some uh, safe data sheet training for the, the machinist. Next slide, please. Uh, our goal uh, and aim in our contract, our agreement with NIOSH, really tracks nicely with the NNI. And this is to develop, disseminate, and, and track the use of training and outreach materials. So, so um, you know, by the way, our, our training doesn't usually get this much merriment going. I'm not sure there may have been some free beer at the end of the session, I don't know, but we've been doing a lot of training on nano for workers. Next, please. Thank you. Uh, just this year, we've delivered awareness training uh, as a train the trainer session that has a curriculum that's, that's tailored right to the audiences we're, we're training. And this is all, in, despite the pandemic, we did it all virtually, but we've trained uh, the International Union of Painters and Allied Trades, who, as Gab was mentioning, our, our inventory, over half of the materials that we have are paints and coatings. So it's a great audience for us to reach out to. We also reached out to National PEAT, which is the Partnership for Environmental Technology Education, it's a network of hundreds of trainers, health and safety trainers across the country. And so we provided materials for them to, re to provide to their trainers. Uh, and we've also done some training for the insulators. And I wanna mention them because uh, they are very concerned having gone through the horrors of asbestos about their members being exposed to anything like, like nanomaterials if they're not sure what's going on. Um, uh, NIOSH did a wonderful um, health hazard evaluation for the insulators of a nanostructured insulation material, which works terrifically, but they were concerned about health effects. So really pleased that um, we have to work with them. Next, please. In our training, we always try to include a group exercise and we wanna use trade specific nano safety data sheets whenever possible. So we pass them out and, and then the, the uh, folks look at it, they answer three questions. Does the safety data sheet mention nano at all? Is there any kind of cautionary language? And finally, does the occupational exposure limit uh, that's included in the safety data sheet uh, just deal with the parent material, graphite versus carbon nanotubes, for instance? Thanks, next slide. So we continue adding to our collection of, of nano toolbox talks, uh, which we've had 10,000 downloads just in one year. I think we have about 10 of these that are specifically for nano. We have uh, maybe 60 altogether for construction. If you're not familiar with a toolbox talk, you're looking at one. This is a supervisor or foreman or some, or some member of the crew giving a safety talk that, that morning before they start. It usually is very relevant. Um, what NIOSH has found doing research in this is that one element that really makes a difference is providing case studies. Workers identify with that. So we've included a case study in all of our safety, uh, excuse me, toolbox talks uh, so that they can discuss the, the case study. We also have, as you're seeing, images on the back of the, of the uh, toolbox talk that um, emphasizes the main points and actually has the three key points. So they can do the presentation and hang it in the trailer or a bulletin board to reinforce the message. And this, these have been very popular. Uh, and I think Bill Cajola is on the call. He's the one who's been doing, driving this. So I, I appreciate his work. Next. We have seen very little useful information on, on nanomaterials in safety data sheets that we've collected. And Gavin mentioned, we have now 735 products in Elkosh as of uh, April 14th. Uh, Sarah Brooks uh, keeps these updated and, and adding more all the time. She's on the call too, I believe. Uh, I asked her to check on this. She said we could not find the safety data sheet for roughly half of these materials that we think are nano enabled. And only about 10% of the products with safety data sheets mention anything related to nano. So there, there's an issue. Next slide, please. 
And, and that issue uh, has been reinforced by several really fine studies by NIOSH. Uh, and this one's from 2019. I saw Laura Hudson is on, I think Chuck Geraci too. So um, this is great. This, their study, they looked at 67 um, uh, safety data sheets and they used two different criteria to judge quality and whether or not they, they had the, the information needed. And you can see it, it's, it's not, it's kind of grim here. We've got, uh, I think, 3% uh, were satisfactory of those, but a whopping 79% needed significant improvement. So we've got a way to go here. Next slide, please. Consequently, we're developing an online tool to improve safety data sheets for nano-enabled nano construction materials. We're just getting this underway uh, Bill Perry, who was formerly with OSHA, is helping to drive this effort. He's been a, a really wonderful addition to our team. Um, next, please. We're also trying to develop an industrial hygiene field guide that's focused on sampling on construction jobs. You're looking at the top row of real-time instrumentation, including at the far end, a scanning mobility particle sizer. Now, this is at our uh, uh, test chamber, and you can see it's there's plastic all around it because we don't want to get uh, spray paint on it. And all these tools are tough to take on job sites in the construction where we've got to deal with the, the, uh, um, with the seasonal changes in the weather and rain. So we're trying to make something that's practical for construction. Down below you see a picture of the uh, cassettes uh, for standard industrial hygiene with personal sampling pumps that we have ready to go on just one of our uh, test uh, uh, with um, nanomaterials in, inside our chamber. Next slide, please. So finally, I just want to say that we continue to try to present our work to a range of stakeholders. Uh, we just did a, a, a um, session at the um, at May 26th at the AIJ's uh, virtual uh, conference and um, Aaron Early was on as was Laura Boatman and my colleague Gavin and went very well. I have spoken internationally in Helsinki and also in Venice. And while in Venice, I showed him the slide and said, you know, you really ought to think about enclosing the city like we did with the Venetian hotel. It just keeps the temperature so comfortable all the time. It did not go over well, and I'm gonna stop at that point. And uh, I think we're at the end of, this, of the session. Thank you. Next slide, the questions and our contact information. So, Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Bruce. Um, so we are now at the uh, point where we get to uh, ask our, our panel questions. Um, while the audience is typing in some questions, I'm going to actually start with one that, that we've had in each of the seminars so far. And it is, no, and, and this is for each of our panelists. So knowing what you know now, is there anything you would change about your career path and what advice would you give to your younger self? So I'm gonna do an order of, of our presentation, start with Christy and... Um, You're starting with me. I'm what starting with you. <laughs> what advice would I give my younger self? Um, well, certainly um, I would give kudos to myself for doing my postdoc with David Warheit, first and foremost. That's a good thing. Um, I probably would do, would have done, uh, I'd tell myself to do maybe a couple of additional postdocs to prepare myself more for grant writing mode um, as an academic. Um, however, um, because I kind of like going between industry and academia um, in my career anyway, um, I probably, I probably, I probably did as good as I could have done. It, the, what I'm trying to say is that there's, there's so many facets to nanotoxicology and, and material science and materials toxicology that, that I, 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 the training is very, very important in, in this space. And, and I, I would say that the training is probably the most important thing to focus on that I, that I needed to think about whenever I was a, a young person. But 
frankly, you know, I really like where I am right now in my career. Um, I feel like because I made some good decisions along, along the way. And the, the thing that I, I think that uh, contributed to that is because I think about both the applications of nanotechnology and the implications of nanotechnology every time that I write a paper or I publish a grant or I help a student with a dissertation. So two sides of the same coin to keep that perspective of the positive and the negative at the same time. I, I think that's what I would tell my, my younger, younger self that, that that's a good thing to continue with. Well, thank you. Uh, Leanne. Same question. <laughs> yeah, this is a great question. Um, so the one thing that I have thought about in terms of my advice to myself would be to read more papers. <laughs> um, the keeping up with the literature is impossible, um, but just really getting in the habit of, of choosing a paper or two to read a week. Um, I, it's always a constant goal of mine. And I think had I gotten into that a little bit sooner, uh, it would be more routine for me. Um, and then, you know, something else would just, that I, that I did and I would give advice to other folks is once we open back up and have conferences in person, like going to conferences is huge. Um, just exposing yourself to new ideas, other perspectives, um, meeting people, talking to people, getting involved in the research that's going on um, across institutions and, and just kind of, I don't know, those are having been locked up for a year or more, you know, those are, re they're really fun. There's a whole, I have a whole new perspective now on conferences and I'll definitely soak them up a, a lot more than I used to, but the, definitely attending conferences and getting out there. Great, thank you. Uh, Gavin. I, I don't have any regrets per se, and you know I still have a ways to go in my career. And hindsight's twenty twenty, so maybe you know there will be some things uh, down the road, and and you can always wonder uh, about alternate career paths and and what what could have been. But uh, I'm I'm very happy and, and thankful for for the work that I've been able to be a part of. You know, doing very applied work in construction, uh, which I think is meaningful and. I, you know, if I had to go back and give myself some advice, it would just be to keep learning. You know, it's a, it's a lifelong pursuit. Surround yourself with uh, good people, smart people, and, and just be open to, to new opportunities and experiences. And, you know, I was, I was very um, thankful to, uh, in a way, stumble upon the nanotechnology research, you know, with a lot of on-the-job on training with Bruce, who's, who's, been, who's been a wonderful mentor, and I was very thankful for that, so... Definitely. Great. So uh, last but not least, again, is, is Bruce. And it looks like we have a couple of extra questions for you too, Bruce. So, uh... Oh, geez. Okay. Well, let me, let me just start <laughs> saying, uh, you know, my career path looks more like the driving pattern of a drunken frat boy than an actual logical series of, of, of decisions. You know, I, I graduated in 1973 uh, with a, a degree in biology. The economy is in the tanks. I ended up doing construction work. And part of my message is, you know, uh, soak up the experiences. You never know when something is going to pay off. So I'm in construction research now because I got into it laying sewer pipe in 1969 before there was even an OSHA. Um, and so, and then I went to art school. I don't even know why to this day. The thing behind me is one of my uh, drawings. It's called a rhinoceros. But I got out with uh, studying graphic design and illustration, and I got a job with Marilyn OSHA because I needed somebody to do brochures and public service announcements. And the guy that hired me said, I can't call you an artist. This is a regulatory agency. I got to call you an industrial hygienist. I said, my wife is pregnant. I'm out of work. You can call me anything you want. So that's how I got into industrial hygiene. And like Gab was saying, 43% of, of our group, uh, industrial hygienists, uh, checked the box, just fell into it in a survey. So uh, you never know how it's going to turn out. And my, my advice uh, to younger folks would be just keep plugging and be opportunistic. There are things open up and, and be ready to say yes to just about anything, even if you think you, you're going to fail. Uh, just give, give it your best and, and don't give up. Uh, so, um, and also, I, I do I agree with Leanne. And I'd love to have done a better job keeping up with the literature, and it's become uh, obscene at this juncture. But that's all I got to say. Thanks, Janet. Uh, excellent, excellent advice, all of you. Uh, 
Bruce, you're you're very interesting, and I love your picture. That is that is just incredible. So um, you have a you have a second career after this. Um, you also have a question. Um, let's see. Is there is there going to appear something similar as the recent EU CLP regulation Annex Two, uh, which obliged to provide include the necessary details of the involved data materials? Uh, that's the question. Um, I think they're asking, are you familiar with the EU CLP? I, I, I'm not. Okay. Um, it's um, it's the uh, um, ECHA regulation on how to um, how to classify label materials. Oh. Uh, so it, it's it's actually an ec excellent document. Um, which there's another question for you. Um, after construction workers, do you have another group that will be focused on? Or are you gonna and are you gonna broaden your your research beyond construction workers? No, our funding from NIOSH uh, is strictly to, to do construction research. We have a number of trades we haven't reached. There are 14 in the uh, North America's Building Trades Union, and it's, that, that's who also we work with. So it's nice we have to keep moving on to different trades, but we don't have any plans to go beyond construction. Um, and, and if you need the link to the ECA CLP, I'm more than happy to provide it for you later because it is it gives a lot of excellent uh, information in there. Um, and I think this is for kind of a whole group. Okay, so what should be included in nanomaterial disclosures that would drive either industrial hygiene or product stewardship uh, decision making regarding approval and use of products? Um, and, and I think that's kind of along the lines of, of Leanne's um, research. Um, so I, I don't know, Leanne, do you want to you want to take that first? I can take a stab to start the conversation, but definitely would like others to to contribute to this. Um, this is this is a difficult one because I think that we can offer scientific guidance on what we would want to include in a disclosure. Um, and then I think, unless these are official disclosures or what, you know, in terms of product stewardship and what we actually label, there's a whole host, I think, of social and behavioral um, contributions that colleagues could make in terms of how do users interface with the products that these nanomaterials are, are used in. Um, I think that just with you know, aside from nanomaterials, I think there's an increasing recognition by society um, and appreciation for wanting to know where um, materials and products come from. And there's been a lot of, of companies that have opened up about their supply chain, um, have there's greater transparency, particularly in like clothing industry. And so I think that, you know, as we consider how we want to disclose information about nanomaterials, thinking carefully about how we want to communicate that to the general public and the and the purchasers of those products will be important. Um, and I'm not sure I, I took that answer in the right direction that um, Jonathan wanted me wanted us to go in, but you know I'll, I'll kind of start the conversation there and, and might have a few more thoughts as others um, chime in uh, in terms of. And I think the audience of the product and, and the information is going to be equally important as, as what it is that's communicated. So volunteers to um, follow up on that. Uh, Jen, I'll just say that, um, you know, OSHA is considering revising that the, the HASCOM standard and uh, based on the GHS, the Global Harmonization System. And the big change that they're proposing is to include particle size. Uh, that'll, that'll be a, a, a tremendous improvement uh, so that even if they don't use the word nano anywhere, you can see the size of the particles. So we're, we're really excited about that because there's just nothing out there beyond that uh, as far as letting folks know. Oh, I, I'm, I'm glad to hear you say that. I am I'm the lead of the, the uh, um, hazard communication standard update. And one of the reasons we included that, well, it was in the GHS, obviously, but um, it goes to exposure. Um, you know, we gave examples of nanomaterials in, in the uh, preamble of the 
the NPRM, but it really is about exposure and, and making certain that workers understand what they're being exposed to. And the best way to do that is to provide that information. So if you are below 100 microns, uh, you have an inhalable particle, you have potential for exposure, and this is the best way to provide that information to workers. So thank you very much for bringing that up. My favorite subject. <laughs> I like the suggestion there of just disclosing a size, right? So even if it's like on a product label and you're looking as an ingredient and rather, I think the, the term nanotechnology as with many sort of um, terms, you know, that, that have a lot in, embedded in the terminology, if it comes down to a size-based effect, you know, why is it that we have to say, you know, um, use the word nano at all. And, and I like the idea or the suggestion of a size listing, um, simply the size and the composition. Um, and, and yeah, uh, certainly um, like particle size distribution, uh, certain characteristics should be, I, I think should be um, in that as well. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Because that, that has to do with exposure too. Any other thoughts? See, do we have another question? I had, oh gosh, I'm sorry. Um, are we out of time or can we go on? Okay, um, so one question. Uh, what recommendations do you have for innovators, industry, and regulatory agencies who are developing, using, and overseeing nanomaterials in diverse consumer products, given your knowledge of nano EHS aspects? That's an excellent. Um, these are very, very in-depth and tough questions to answer. <laughs> uh, I, I thank um, Kara Grieger for asking that question. And in fact, Kara is uh, a renowned expert in and of her own self, of herself in that particular space of what recommendations um, might, what e EHS type of recommendations might you um, might you want to consider in product development and in innovation and uh, other research uh, for bringing a product to market. Um, communication, of course, I would say is, is the first and foremost um, the, the best recommendation. We just kind of talked about that a little bit about what to disclose, what not to disclose. I, I think that if a, if a company or a innovator, um, a product developer is not going to disclose, then they ought to maybe have a they ought to have a justification and a reason to follow that up of why it is. I think that us hiding behind um, intellectual property and then zipping our lips um, is it's good as far as keeping a company, um, their intellectual property safe, but it's not good enough for an EHS um, researcher or someone who focuses on EHS. So, if communication can increase more creatively and have uh, more information, maybe that it doesn't have to do with disclosing the IP, um, then I think that would be very useful moving forward for the innovators. Jenna, can I also say, I, I believe yes. it would be good for manufacturers to think about foreseeable misuse. That's a legal concept that's getting a lot of attention, but you know, if you're going to make something, uh, look at the whole down the line and think about someone just not understanding how, how to properly use it. Uh, and I, I would say talk to manufacturers of lawn darts if, if they don't know what, what I'm talking about. But, uh, you know, there's a lot of products out there uh, that may need a, a fair amount of instruction and how do, how do workers get that? Excellent. Thank you. Um, and any other points on, on that one? We can move to the next question, if not. Um, so, uh, Chuck Jarasi has asked, uh, do you see a crossover between nano EHS research and the growing interest in ultrafine particle concerns? And to me, it seems like we're kind of going back to where we started 20-some um, years ago, but I'd like to hear your guys' thoughts on that as well. Janet, I was, I was thinking the same thing, that in your introduction, you talked about some of uh, Gunther Overdoster's uh, early work and, and how that you know, kind of raised some of the early concerns about nanoparticles and, and to their connection to ultrafine particles. And I think in, in our kind of niche area of research working in construction, it's, it's very relevant. 
because um, you know we do have these newer engineered nanomaterials, but we, we've also you know had these ultra fine particle exposures, for example, from processes like welding. And in our studies where we've looked at you know, braiding different materials, you find that in some of the, the matrix and, and you know, when you're looking at these conventional materials without engineered nanomaterials present, you still have ultrafine particle emissions uh, from different sources. And I think that, yeah, it's important not to disregard those as well and to think about those exposures and, and potential health effects. Great, thank you. Um... And any other thoughts on that one? I would just say that the those two bodies of literature um, uh, need to be thought about in iterations and we can continue to refine and update experimental designs for incidental nanomaterials versus engineered nanomaterials and they just can continue to inform each other as the, the next 10 years go by. And frankly, you know, I, I've reviewed papers recently submitted to peer-reviewed literature on asbestos thinking about asbestos in the same way. Um, what about particulates in our drinking water? They may not be uh, engineered nano, but certainly there are plenty of incidental nanoparticles in our drinking water as well. So I think that there's a lot of different from, an, if you put on your environmental science hat, I think that there is a lot of exposures um, from the environment, intentional or unintentional, incidental or engineered, that Ideally, the nano talks community and the bodies of papers can help inform and we can all uh, make the papers in all fields better by adopting the rules of trade in each in each other's uh, published literature. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so let me ask the, uh, Jonathan, ask another question. Is there key physical chemical characteristics, biological activity or encapsulated or bound states that uh, I think uh, that really probably um, uh, affect their, um, their biological activity and their, um, ad or their potential adverse effects. So I'll, I'll take this one, I guess, you know, just kind of reiterating some of the things that we've shown is that the um, the chemistry on the surface is really important. Um, but understandably, when, you know, we study that at a really refined, sort of simplified level, um, to gain that understanding mechanistically, we have to then broaden that out because there's a lot more appreciation now for the matrix that these materials are actually seeing within biological and environmental systems. Um, things like protein coronas that now cover the surface and interactions through aggregation or for natural organic matter and things like that that have been widely studied. And so translating the sort of what I say, quote unquote, truths that kind of guide these design rules that we're developing is really then thinking now about it in a more complex system and whether those um, behaviors, which I call consequential properties of the system that the material is in, uh, significantly changes that behavior of the material or not. And, and for us, it's really the influence of the surface chemistry and those specific chemical features. Um, and I think that that's a, a, an appreciation that has come later in the evolution of um, the toxicology research, uh, but it's just very complex. And, and I think generally, like we're, we're talking about this. I think Janet, you started out by saying, you know, we're still hearing this, we don't, you know, we don't know about whether these materials are actually hazardous or not. And it's just, this is a very challenging problem to work on. Like, this is why we're still talking about it. And this is, there's no simple answer. We're not gonna come up with the, you know, these materials are safe and these materials aren't. And this is the simple way to turn that on and off. Um, it's very dependent on a number of different characteristics of the system that they're being used in. and and. And that's something that I think the community is still grappling with and working towards what are these guidelines based on the intended use? What are the guidelines based on the material properties? Um, and, and I think that it's understandable given, you know, the infinite number of <laughs> materials that we have. Uh, and, and when you think about the work done on a simple chemical, you know, not simple, but um, a chemical class, a, a class of chemicals versus what we're talking about um, a class of nanomaterials is infinitely in orders of magnitude greater. And so it's going to take that much more effort to, to try and 
gain some um, guiding principles. And, and I think if you think about it that way, the community's done a really good job um, in, in kind of guiding us into sort of the future of what, of what this looks like. Okay, we have five more minutes. So I just want to add a, a little something to that based on some, some research that I, when I used to be in, the, in research, uh, we had published a series of papers on carbon black and um, looking at um, various carbon black particles based on uh, differing surface areas. They were, they were similar in particle size, but they had varying surface, uh, surface areas. And we saw dramatic differences in three different species and we published a series of papers. So there really are uh, chemical or physical characteristics that, that can affect the adverse effect. And knowing that and knowing the, the specific use of it, and then knowing the potential hazard of it uh, can really, I think, direct its use and its uh, risk management. So there is a lot we know. You, we, it's just, you, it's, it, you're right, it's complex and we have to put the pieces together. Um, so I, 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 appreciate, um, I appreciate all of this, this thoughtful discussion. Um, there is a question on why avoid the word nano. We were talking about exposures earlier, and um, <laughs> so why avoid the word nano? <laughs> so I think I, I might have said something along those lines, so I'll, I'll mention this. Um, uh, just in relation to what we were just talking about is that we have a lot more information and knowledge about how the nanomaterials interact with biological systems, and so labeling as like nanomaterial A or B seems too general for what we what we know. And so I think, you know, as, as Bruce mentioned, a specific size, a specific composition, if we know a surface area, you know, whatever it is that we've learned about a particular nanomaterial that governs how it behaves, that I think is more important and informative to be disclosed than just saying, you know, nanoparticulate titanium dioxide. Um, and that, that was sort of the impetus for my, for my uh, mentioning that. Oh, uh, excellent. Um, so are, uh, are you seeing any new research around poorly soluble, low toxicity nanomaterials and human health? Uh, there is, and actually there is a lot of attention of it in Europe. I think there's a symposium coming up um, later on in uh, the year. Uh, I would say that um, one area that um, a couple, uh, more than a couple, um, a significant amount of nanotoxicology researchers have gravitated towards is the microplastics, nanoplastics epidemic that we're experiencing. Um, I think that polymers in general, um, well, of course, depending on their, their chemical composition and a variety of other physical chemical properties, but we don't necessarily think of them um, as a, a high um, dose exposure, or and even if we are to be exposed to them, they are probably low toxicity because by now we've seen all the papers and reports that even humans um, are excreting microplastics in, in feces as well. So I think that there is a movement from uh, nanotoxicologists to help address that particular concern. Um, it kind of goes back to a, a surface um, issue, as Leanne was talking about previously, what are some of the predominant physical chemical properties that, that we ought to continue looking at? And of course it is the surface. Um, microplastics and nanoplastics in particular uh, absorb and absorb and adsorb um, many different other types of contaminants, chemicals that may be in the environment. So with this other mechanism that we love to talk about called the Trojan horse mechanism, which again, I think if you think of it that way, that is a physical chemical property for which we should always focus on as well. What, what are we transporting into different compartments in the environment or in the human body that might have a direct exposure and a concentrated exposure to some particular um, um, contaminant that may be absorbed or absorbed onto the surface of the nanoparticle or the nanoplastic and then get into the environment or humans. So I think we have just a minute left. Um, so what are your, and this is to the group, uh, for toxicity and biological effects studies, 
What are your thoughts on how the nanomaterial dose should be reported in terms of mass surface area or particle numbers, as we discussed earlier? Uh, the study outcome could have very different interpretations depending on how it's reported. Any thoughts on that? Therefore, all of the above. I, I, I don't see any problem with all of us using our stoichiometry um, mad skills and, and converting in our single paper that we publish, converting the, the units from even to molarity if, 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 if possible. Uh, parts per million, molarity, surface area, you know, this would be excellent type of movement into the future for not just nano, but for any other low toxicity, per, poorly soluble types of things that we're gonna move in, that we are moving into as the next decade goes by. Let us do the stoichiometry and report those values in the papers we publish. Absolutely, and I think just the fact that you get to say stoichiometry is, is really great, so. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I think that's, I think that's pretty much the, end here. Um, thank you all. Thank, thank uh, all the participants for hanging in there with us. Thanks for all the great questions. Thanks to our panelists. You guys have been fantastic. Really appreciate it so much. A lot of great information. And thanks always to the NNCO. They do a fantastic job. Um, and we just are, are uh, very indebted to them. So um, thank you very much. Everybody give yourself a uh, a, a round of applause. <laughs> thank you for moderating, Janet. Oh, thank you. It was fun. I, 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 I loved, um, I loved meeting you guys, the ones that I didn't already know, and it's been great. So thank you. Okay. Bye -bye. Thank you.